for, well, I tell you, I had a lot of hair, and one of it, none of it was gray. That'll tell you how long ago it's been. Uh, I met Pastor Jerry when uh, Sandy and I, which today is our anniversary. Yeah. We have been married 31 years today. No. 30? Stand up and tell everybody. 28 years. You know, one time, one time uh, it got to, towards the end of June, and I thought, oh, no, I forgot our anniversary. And I thought, well, she must have forgot it, too. So I called Attitude. You know, I was acting like, she's like, what's wrong with you? I said, oh, if you don't know, I ain't going to tell you. That felt so good, man. You ever wanted to do that? Well, I told her, I said, you forgot our anniversary. I said, it was on June the 14th. She said, no, Jack, it was June 9th. <laughs> anyway, I met your pastor years and years ago. We uh, had got the uh, high school auditorium where we were youth pastors. And uh, I'd heard about him. And I called and said, hey, we're doing a, a deal at our high school. We got the auditorium. He said, isn't that illegal? I said, probably. He said, well, I'm in. I said, all right. Pastor Jerry's one of the most dynamic guys. Man, I can hang around Pastor Jerry for 10 minutes, and, and he changes my life. Amen. Anybody ever watch that movie, Tombstone? You remember where they had this shootout, and one of them asked Doc Holliday, he says, Doc, what are you doing in this mess? He said, Wide Earp is my friend. And that guy said, man, I got lots of friends. And he said, I don't. <laughs> Can I tell you something? The older I get, my list of friends gets smaller and smaller because you know who you can count on. You know who you can trust in. But Pastor Jerry is, is a dynamic speaker. He's an awesome pastor, just a great guy. And I was thinking uh, this morning, if you took a menu and it had like preachers on there, at the very top of the menu, it would say, Pastor Jerry, T-bone steak. <laughs> Fillet mignon. <laughs> chicken teriyaki. And then I'd find my name. You'd have to look, and then you'd turn to the other side. Oh, yeah, down here below the Coca-Colas. Kenneth Smith, biscuit. <laughs> Heated, extra 25 cents. But that's the way I feel trying to, trying to fill Pastor Jerry's shoes. He is an incredible man of God, and, and I love him, and he's my friend. But it is our anniversary. My daughter's with us this morning, Emily Rose. It's just great to be here. Now, I'm going to give you some biscuit and gravy preaching this morning. Amen? Amen. When I was a boy, my daddy always had fighting chickens. Anybody ever been to a chicken fight? Well, you put gaffs on them, and, you, and, and these chickens fight to the death. You breed them. Man, we used to have a, a, a line of green-legged hatches and uh, brown reds, and, man, they were bad to the bone. And we had this one rooster. We called him an ace because he always won. And after a chicken became an ace, you'd put him on the yard, and you'd let him run around with the hens. Well, man, this, like I said, this little rooster, we had bred him, bred his, his daddy and his mama, and we'd raised him since he was a chick, and he was a bad little dude. Weighed about four and a half pounds. Well, I'd feed him every day. One day a guy come up, and he said, talk to my daddy. He said, hey, Gator, do you want this turkey I got? And daddy said, yeah, I'll take him, throw him out. Threw this big old Tom turkey out. Weighed about 25 pounds probably. Well, that evening when I started feeding the chickens, this turkey and this chicken, they come up there and went to eat and that little rooster looked up at that turkey like, hey, this is my corn. And that big turkey looked down at him and he said, not anymore. So I just decided to watch and see what happened. So this little chicken man, he jumps into that turkey and begins to tear him up. And that turkey begins to try to fight back. And that little chicken man, even though this turkey outweighs him like four to one, this little chicken is just, man, he just flogging him and shuffling on him and putting the spurs to him and it's kind of the way we are when we have to fight giants and and the enemy always wants to come and steal and kill and destroy and take away from you the blessings that God has given you but he will come and he will try to take it and he always looks like a giant and, and this little 
chicken, man, he was fighting. And, and, and as I look back, I think, I, I could see us trying to fight the giants in our life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm more than a conqueror. Come on. But eventually this turkey began to change his tactics. He wasn't trying to flog the little rooster anymore. He began to try to peck him. Man, that little rooster would zip to this side. And he would zip to that side. And then the turkey changed his tactics again. He began to take that big old foot and just try to step on that little chicken. And he was trying to step on him. That little chicken's tearing him up. But eventually he got a foot on that rooster. And he pushed him down to the ground. And then he put his other foot on top of him. See, if the enemy cannot get you with your finances, he will try to get you with your health. If he can't get you with your health, come on, somebody. He'll figure something out. He's going to find something that pushes your buttons, that makes you want to give up, lay down, and quit. He will change his tactics over and over and over and over and over. But he was standing on this little chicken, and he began to peck him. And I thought, he's going to kill that little rooster. But then I had a thought. I remembered Hey, I know the breeding of that little rooster. I know what that little rooster's made of. I've seen him in the pit against other roosters, and I've never seen him lose. And time and time again, he always fought his way back. See, many of us, we feel like we've been stood on by a turkey, and we've been beat up and, and stepped on and pecked in the face and slapped around and abused, and you're wondering, God, where are you? And God's saying, I know who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I know who you are. You're my child. I know who you are. I knew you were before you were formed in your mother's womb. I knew you. And that little rooster, he began to wiggle. And he began to shake. And before long, he popped back up. And he ripped that turkey up his backside. Roop. And he shuffled again. Roop. And he hit him again. Roop. And then that turkey went... And he took off running. And can I tell you, that was the funniest thing I ever saw. That big old four-foot turkey running through the woods. And you've got a four-and-a-half-pound, 11-inch tall chicken chasing him. <laughs> and you know what? Every evening, that chicken ate what he wanted. And the turkey had to stand back and watch. Come on, that's right. Because his breeding was right. Because he knew that he knew he was a winner. Can I tell you something? We can overcome. No matter how big the giants, the turkeys in our life are. All I'm on giants, I might as well talk about a giant. Ain't got nothing to do with my sermon today, but I'm here. Come on, amen. Amen? amen? Can I tell you the thing about giants? Are they big? Remember Goliath standing across the valley yelling and hollering? Giants are always big. They want to block your vision. They want to stand in the way of where you're going. They want to stop you from seeing the things that God wants you to see. They're big. Another thing is they're loud. They demand your attention. Oh, yeah, you're going to show me attention. Yeah, you're going to cater to me because I'm the giant in your life. I'm that addiction that screams at you every day. I'm that, I, I, I'm that, 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 that financial situation that, that you can't seem to get over. And I'm going to scream at you every day because I'm going to have the bill collectors call it. Are we all right? Yeah, come on. We good? Yeah. Feel it mignon, right? Yeah. T-bone steak. I started to say weenie on a bun instead of a biscuit. <laughs> but I'm more of a biscuit, I think. But they're loud. Another thing giants are, are ugly. What are the ugly things in your life? You know, when, when Goliath stood across there and he yelled and he hollered, I've got to watch my time here. And he yelled and he hollered and he screamed. See, the thing about Goliath is he knew what he could do. He had broke a many a man down. He had skewered a many a person in his time. He was a champion. He knew what he could do. You send anybody across that battlefield and I'm going to take them down. See, Saul, Goliath knew what he could do. Saul knew what he should do. 
instead of trying to give his armor to somebody else, he should have put his armor on and went out there and faced the giant. Come on, that's right. And a lot of times we want somebody else to do the heavy lifting yeah. while we sit back and enjoy the spoils. One time Sandy and I heard this noise in our house, blam. We woke up, she said, what was that? I don't know. I told her, I said, you go check it out and I'll follow behind you. She said, why are you going to follow behind me? I said, if anybody comes in and tries to sneak up on you, I'll be there, baby. <laughs> Goliath knew what he could do. Saul knew what he should do. But David knew what God would do. Right. We got coulds, we got shoulds, and we got woulds. You got your Bibles this morning. All that was free. You got your Bible? Turn with the book of 2 Kings, chapter 7. We're going to start reading in verse number 3. This is where Pastor Jerry says, Are you comfortable? <laughs> uh huh, he ain't here today. We thought we'd just go sit down. It says, now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to the, their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots, the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact. Their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news. Somebody say good news. Good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and cried to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, we went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly, no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys and tied and tents intact. Lord, we just thank you for your word today, that it is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you today, Lord Jesus, that I don't come as some great orator, but Lord, I come in a demonstration power of the Holy Ghost. I thank you today, Lord Jesus, that in us you would live and move and have your being, Lord God, that we would not... Leave this place the same as we got here. But, Lord, we would leave full of the, uh, of the, of the Spirit. Lord, full of vision. Ah, full of the revelation, knowledge of the Word. We love you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. And somebody said, Amen. 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 Tell somebody, cry of the unclean. Cry of the unclean. You got three, uh, I'm going to say three different kinds of people. Three different kinds of people. I know there's four at the gate, but we're going to talk about three different kinds. Now, you got to know here that, that, uh, that the city was under siege. The Syrians had come. They were under siege. Everybody was starving to death. It was bad. It was tough. They didn't know what they was going to do. Everybody lived in fear. Everybody was hungry. And then you had four lepers sitting outside the gate. You got four guys sitting outside the gate, and they're lepers. They're unclean. They can't. I know Sandy's cringing. She tried to give me a white handkerchief this morning, but I had to roll with the camo. <laughs> so you got these four guys, and they say, what are our options? What are our options? They said, the first thing, you know, they said, they said I guess we can just Sit here till we die. Just sit here. Why do we find ourselves just sitting? See, there's many, many reasons why I think we find ourselves sitting. A lot of us come to church and we just sit. It seems like we're just waiting on an opportunity. Waiting for something to happen. 
waiting for Moses to part the Red Sea, waiting for Pastor Jerry to get a, a, a word from God and call you out and say, I'm lifting you up. But we come and we sit. And a lot of times we sit because we feel disqualified. I can't get involved in the church. I can't do anything for God. I, I can't do that because I'm unclean. If these people ever knew the kind of life that I used to live, they would throw rocks at me when I come into the church. They would judge me. They would look down on me. They would talk about me. So we sit because we feel like we're unclean because of the decisions and the bad decisions we made in our past. So we keep sitting because the next thing we do is pretty much give up. Why do I want to, to try again? Because everything I've ever done has failed. My daddy always told me I was a loser. You know, my daddy used to tell me, you'd have to know my daddy. He, he passed on a couple of years ago, but he was a hard man. Man, he was a tough dude. And he told me, you know, he said, son, I always wish I'd have killed you when you was young so I could have got away with it. I love you too, Dad. <laughs> my old grandpa one time, give you an example of my dad. My old grandpa had fell and broke his hip, and he had already had a stroke, and he was crippled. And I was about 10 years old, and I was having to take care of him. He was out of school for the summer, and I'd have to pick him up, put him in a wheelchair, take him to the bathroom. I mean, he couldn't do anything for himself, and it went on for about a month. And uh, he'd always wake me up like at 4 o'clock in the morning and make coffee. My dad got up to go to work one morning. We'd come in there, and he looked at my grandpa. He said, you know, Daddy, he said, you're not doing your exercises. You're not trying to get better. He said, I've thought about it. When I get home from work, you see, I'm going to take you down the creek, and I'm going to kill you and leave you laying there. My old grandpa went to crying, and I went to crying. My daddy left, and my grandpa said, Son, do you think he'll kill me? I said, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's going, he gets on, Paul Casey, you, you're dead. <laughs> Man, we sat there and cried about 10 minutes, and my old grandpa said, come over here, son, help me. I said, what? He said, I want to try to stand up. I went over there, and, man, he shook, and I helped him. He collapsed, and all day long, we practiced him standing up. My dad got home from work. My grandpa said, said, Son, look what I can do. An old fellow struggled. Man, he stood up like that and he fell back down. My daddy looked at him. He said, you bought yourself another day, old man. That was my daddy. My daddy always told me I was worthless. I was useless. I'd never amount to anything. But my heavenly father said, I got a plan for you. Amen. See, we don't get up. We stay seated. Seated. Because we feel like we're disqualified, our upbringing, the way we were raised, the way people see us, the things we've done in the past, the mistakes we've made, because we feel weak. I have nothing to offer. Oh, man. You have no idea the things that God wants to use you to do. Sometimes we don't do it because we just simply don't know what to do. But mainly, I think a lot of times we just don't do anything because we feel unclean. In Isaiah chapter 6, I want to turn there real quick and read something to you. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two covered his face. Two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And he cried to one another and says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my lips with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity has been taken away, and your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who shall go for us? 
You know, in Isaiah's life, King Uzziah had to die. For many of us, there's certain things in our life that's going to have to die before we will begin to look up, begin to stand up, begin to answer the call. Isaiah felt unclean. He felt dirty because of the people he dwelt with, because where he was from, because the things he had said. But God said, I got a plan. And he cleansed him. You know, I think it's incredible how close so many of us are to entering into the place that God has for us. We're just on the precipice of greatness. We're just on the edge of doing something incredible. I think about in the book of Acts, chapter 3, when Peter and John went to the temple and they said there was a man that had been lame and, and his, his family would bring him every day and set him at the, at the gate beautiful, at the, at the entrance to the temple. And he sat there for years begging, begging for anything anybody could give him. He, he would take a penny, he would take a nickel, just, just give me something. And for years he had sat there and begged. His family had to bring him and drop him off. And man, what a, what a pain it would be, I would imagine, it had gotten to be. And, but one day when they walked by, and now you got to remember this man had sat at the temple. He saw people go in. He saw people come out. He could hear the music inside. He could hear the praise inside. He could hear people's lives being changed inside. He would see people walk in going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then he'd see him come out the temple. Whoa, God is good God is good and he would see this day after day after day but he couldn't go in Peter come along and said I don't have silver and gold what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ and as get up and walk and the man jumped to his feet and he leaped and he went into the temple do you know why he couldn't go into the temple the same reason many of us never go into the true presence of God because we're spiritually lame. We got something wrong with our walk and we won't confront it and we won't deal with it. Is this too hard? Something is wrong with our walk. God says do this, but we don't. God says go there, but we don't. Hmm. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us today. Amen. Amen. The second type of person is a person that thinks about going back. Remember what they said, we can sit here and die or we can just go back into the city. Do me a favor this morning, let's call the city the world. See, the world today is full of fame, fortune, glitter, gold, man, every kind of thing you can imagine. If you got the, if you got the money, honey, I got the time. Right. Willie Nelson. If you got the money, honey, I got the time. That's what the world screams at us. See, the world is, is, is full of people who live in excess. See, can I tell you, this city, all these people were starving to death, but it was full of silver and it was full of gold. Can I tell you, in this country today, people are spiritually starving to death, driving around in our Escalades, in our air condition, listening to our music, watching our 80-inch screen TVs. Man, we're rolling in it, but we're spiritually starving to death. We're hungry. Somebody say, I'm hungry. Man, we're hungry for the things of God. We're hungry and we're starving to death, but we just constantly don't know what to do. The city was full of silver. And we, we came back up here and, and look in, in uh, chapter 6. It says that there was a great famine indeed. They besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Man, they were paying thousands of dollars for a donkey's head so they'd have something to eat. 
So don't tell me, man, they, man they, had, they had the silver, they had the gold. See, this world will offer you all kinds of ideas and things, but you can look at all the, the rich and the famous that, that, that take their lives because they cannot find what they're looking for in drugs and alcohol and sex. They can't find what they're looking for in fame and fortune. And we could, we could just make a list. You got Heath Ledger. You got Anna Nicole. You, you, you just on and on and on. Robin Williams. A bunch of different ones. The city was full of silver and gold. See, many times when we find ourselves beat up, stood on by the turkey, confronting giants in our life, we often think it might be easier just to go back. It might be easier, and I guarantee you, somebody under the sound of my voice today, sometime this week, you thought about the good old days. The good old days. The days when, when before, before Jesus. The days when I just did what I wanted to do any time I wanted to do it. And we forget it's those people that forsook us to start with. We forget it's those people that when they looked at us serving Jesus would say things to us like, boy, ain't you just got above your raising? Anybody ever hear that? Ain't you just got above your raising? You probably don't even eat squirrels anymore. Not unless I kill it. Thousands of dollars for a donkey's head. We think about going back. And then you got people that go forward, and I got to put it in gear here and ease on through this. You got people that go forward. See, it's called walking by faith. If you can see the beginning, or if you can see the end from the beginning, it's, it's not faith at all. Hebrews 11 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not th the things not seen. We got to get up and go. We have to do something, even if we don't know what to do. In verse 5, it says, they arose at twilight. And I think that's really a, a cool verse because they didn't wait till daylight. They didn't wait and say, okay, we're going to go to the enemy's camp as soon as we can see. See, we want, we want God to light it up. We want God to show us everything before we even begin. That's good. Come on. God said, I'm going I'm to make it a, a lamp unto your foot. You're going to have to take a step. Anybody ever been lost in the dark? Man, I have. I was hunting on Mill Creek one time. It's about a two-mile walk on that Sabine River where I was raised. And I, I could see a deer on the other side, on the Texas side. And I'm not going to say I ain't never shot a deer across that river on the Texas side, but I didn't that day. And I was thinking this deer, he acting like he was acting like he was going to cross. So I waited on him till black dark, and he didn't cross. So I, I started walking back towards the truck. And about halfway through, going through all the vines and the briars, I thought I heard something behind me. And I didn't have a flashlight or nothing. Man, I took a few more steps, and I heard it again. Now, some of y'all are looking at me thinking, man, a big old muscled-up dude like you can't be scared, right? I understand. <laughs> but you know what? I found myself running Come on. Yeah. in the dark with a 30 out six. And I thought, you know what? If whatever that is is going to eat me and I got a rifle, it's going to catch me and eat me anyway. So I slowed down and I began to walk and I made, I made it to my destination. See, so many times we want God to show us everything. They didn't wait till daylight. They went at dark. See, we, we're always wanting to see. Show us a sign. Show us something. Give us, give us something. It's kind of like in Matthew when Jesus Send his disciples out in the boat, and they're out in the boat in the wind and the wave, and everything's going crazy, and, and they look, and they see Jesus walking on the water, and, and they freak out. It's a ghost. Watch out. 
And I can understand the wind, the waves being tossed back and forth. Surely this ain't going to end good. And then a ghost on top of it. But then Jesus spoke, and they recognized his voice. See, they didn't recognize the way Jesus walked, although they was walking with him every day. They didn't recognize his swagger, his style. They didn't recognize his face. But they heard his voice, and they knew that they knew it was him. See, a lot of times we're in the wave and the, and, and the boat's breaking up and we don't know what's going to happen. And we're looking for Jesus. We're looking. We're looking for a sign. We're looking for something to happen. But we don't hear his voice. When you hear the voice of the great shepherd and you are his sheep, you know everything's going to be all right. You know everything's going to be all right. But why did... Why did God use these men who stepped out into the darkness? What was it about them? Was it because they were great warriors? No. No, they wasn't great warriors. Man, they just chilling at the gate. Was it because they were dignitaries? They were important people? No. Was it because they had it all together? They were perfect people. Anybody know any perfect people? Their yard always looks perfect. Their garage is never cluttered. Their car is always shiny. Hello? That's not me. Man, I like a little high grass. Kind of wash your feet when you walk through it. Sandy don't like high grass. Did he use them because they had figured it all out? Did he use them because they were the most talented? Why does God use people? You've got to remember these guys were lepers. They were unclean folk. And we know that in the Bible, it, that in those days, that if a person was unclean, they had to walk around, and if they got around other people, they had to cry out, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. So why would God use unclean people? You remember they went and they found that the, the, the camp was empty. They found gold. They found silver. They found food, everything that we needed. And they said, but this is a day of good news. So they go back. And what do these people who had spent their entire lives crying out unclean, unclean do? They cried out. The enemy's gone. They cried out because they knew how to cry out. They had been stepped on their entire lives, looked down upon their entire lives. They had to walk into a place, I'm unclean. I'm dirty. I've lied. I've cheated. I've stole. I've, I've done things that I'm not proud of. But God uses the people who have been there. People who know when they find a good thing that it's a good thing. Man, this is a day of good news. We found something good here. Come on. Now what am I going to do with it? I'm going to use what God gave me, the ability to cry out. Yes, I know I was lost, but now I'm found. Come on. I know I was blind, but now I see. I know that everybody else gave up on me, but Jesus didn't. Yeah. I know that I know that I know that he loves me. So why did he use them? He used them because they knew how to cry out because they had been down that road. Now I want to, t I just want to tell you this morning, no matter what your past circumstance, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter the lies you've told or the drugs you've used, it does not matter. God can still use you. And he brought you to this place called the Little Country Church with a band called the Baptist Bar and Grill so that you could hook up with other criers. Yeah, so that you could hook up with other people that's been down that road. Yeah. So that you could connect with somebody else that knows how to cry out when they get a hold of something that's good news. When you get a hold of something that's good news and you get a hold of somebody else that recognizes the good news, man, look out. Because somebody's life is about to change. Somebody's life is about to change. 
we have to step out into the darkness many times. God loves to use unperfect people to fulfill, an un, to fulfill a perfect plan. People with an ugly past to bring forth a beautiful future. People who know pain to usher in peace. And po people who have been down to help others up. A couple of years ago, I found myself being stood on by a turkey. And I had all but given up. I was sitting. I was looking back. And all I could see in front of me was darkness. Hello. After preaching the word for 20 plus years and then all of a sudden I found myself where my big list of preacher friends that, that once I had a big church and the money was rolling and the people was rolling, man, I had friends. And I found myself with two friends. A brother named Roger Fowler in Missouri. And a man named Jerry Hovatter. And a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from him. And I'm going to do my best impression. <laughs> Kenus? Come on. Come on. Kenus? Hey, Pastor Jerry. I'm going to get on my scooter and I'm coming to see you, boy. I said, well, Pastor Jerry, I don't get off work till late. And it's going to be late before I get home. What time you get home, son? I said, by 730. I'll be there on my scooter. And I don't care how bad your breath stinks. <laughs> That's what that man told me. But you know what? Him and Richard rode in motorcycles three hours to my house. Late in the evening. In the summertime. When it was hot. To tell me that they knew how to cry too. That they knew how to cry too. Won't you stand with me this morning? God expects us. In any season. To continue to step into the darkness. You say well preacher you don't understand what I'm walking through right now. No I probably don't. But I guarantee you Jesus does. You remember the story where Jesus cursed the fig tree. It says that he saw the fig tree afar off. And it looked good for fruit. But when he got there there was no fruit on it. And he cursed it and it died. And his disciples. The next day said uh. Hey, man, what happened, you know? And the Word says it, to, it wasn't the season for figs. See, many of us, we come to church and we look like we produce fruit. We know how to speak the language. We know how to dress. We know what to do. But we don't bear fruit. So it does not matter what season your life is in, no matter, no matter what you're walking through. Jesus will give you the ability to produce fruit. We got any criers in here this morning? Anybody been down the road? Come on. Would you close your eyes with me this morning? Dear Lord, today we just thank you that, Lord, we've been places and we've seen things, but Lord, we thank you today that you brought us through. Lord, you've brought us through famine. You've brought us through sickness. You've brought us through strife. You've brought us through hard places, Lord. And Lord, we got the good news. And here at the little country church, Lord Jesus, I just thank you that, Lord, as we come together as believers, Lord, as, as we stand behind our pastor, because, Lord, you'll never put anybody in this pulpit greater than that man. Lord, that we could follow the vision. Lord, even though I can't see, even though it's dark, even though I don't, know, I don't know what's next, I don't know what's in front of me, I just know that I know that I have to take a step. And Lord, you'll light that place. If 
you in this place this morning, you say, preacher, I feel like I've been sitting. Or maybe I feel like I feel like I, I might be going back towards the city. Won't you just raise your hand this morning? I just want to pray with you. So I don't want to sit no more. I don't I don't want to I don't want to idle anymore, but I want to produce fruit in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, today I just pray an anointing that would just come down. Lord God, that it would just fill us. Lord God, it would heal us from the inside out. Lord, that by your Holy Ghost that something would happen in us that would change our lives forever. And Lord, we would take those experiences, we would take those places we've been and those things we've done and those things that the devil meant to harm us. And Lord, we would allow you to turn them around and make something good out of it. So Lord, I just pray for all of us today. Let us be movers. Let us step into the darkness. Let us be everything you want us to be. We love you and give you praise today in Jesus' mighty name. And somebody said amen. 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 The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> my wife is my better half. There is no doubt. Uh, Brother Kenneth, that was incredible. Thank you, sir. I know you blessed the people today. Amen. Give him a hand clap. You not only did a good job, but you honored your friend. And that's more important than anything. Amen. At this time, I'd like to have our servant leaders come forward. We have some announcements. If you guys need a tithe or offering envelope, just lift your hand. They're coming around. Uh, June the 9th, we have SWAP Senior Bible Study. June the 12th, uh, we have uh, 12th and 13th with Camp Holy Wild Ropes. That's this week. Um, see Sister Lori or talk to her. Talk to me. Talk to Joseph. I believe what that's uh, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, if you guys can make it, come hang out with us. We love seeing you all out there. June fifteenth, Jewels for Christ. See Miss Diane. Uh, you have a, you gonna be in the back? See Miss Diane in the back. Uh, June sixteenth will be uh, the Lift Bible Study. That's the ladies. See Miss Diane Feeling. Um, and uh, next month, July fifteenth, uh, the youth here. At the, Crosby will be going to Six Flags. So that'll be 7th grade through the 12th grade. If you guys want to go, um, just talk to me after service. All right? That's uh, June, uh, July 15th. And yes, I would like to see your daughter and your son and all their friends go too. Uh, today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission. Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom.